This is SciBite, episode 133 for June 3rd, 2014. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, live on a Tuesday and fresh on a Wednesday over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. So, what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to take a look at NASA testing the world's largest heat shield, ancient evidence of Lyme disease, sign language on glasses, Story and spacecraft updates, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Well, holy guacamole, Heather, let's kick off the science with the news. All right, what is our science starting point tonight, Heather? Technicians at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida have attached the world's largest heat shield to a version, a sort of prototype version of the NASA's Orion Crew capsule. This is uh, NASA's new I- new version of, uh, you know, sending men into space. It's, they're gonna not doing it sh- the, like the shuttle. They're going to do it more like capsule on the, type, on the top of a mm-hmm. uh, Delta IV rocket. Right. More like, oddly enough, more like a think Apollo type style. Old school. Yeah, going back old school. Except these new rockets can, I mean, they can go like 15 times higher than the space station which means it'd be further than humans have gone in 40 years. So that's not saying a great deal. <laughs> but um, so this new kind of generation of NASA uh, version of the vehicles, underdeveloped, it's, you know, it's to do this one, it's specifically the largest heat shield that has ever been bit, built, bigger than Apollo, bigger than the uh, Curiosity heat shield. So this is sort of, initial tests to sort of kind of dip their toes in the water and say, all right, well, how does this work? And if it works well, then they'll kind of go on to the next stage of testing it on a prototype mm. of the capsule itself and then kind of moving forward step by step until they can get a, a more realistic version of it put together, testing it um, unmanned, of course, so they can test that a whole bunch of times and take it in sensors because that's the big question is what kind of protection can it offer because if it's supposed to be manned then there's a specific range of temperatures that people that earthlings are happy at (laughs) that we function properly at yeah that's true that's very true and you know you think summer is hot but no you, you can still function you're hot but there's a limit to the functioning and when you're going back into the atmosphere at you know when the heating on the outside of the spacecraft is, you know, 4,000 degrees F or 22, over 2200 C, then it's a little bit hotter than you'd like to be around. Yeah, very now, true. This specific heat shield is 16 and a half feet, five meters. And so it's, and it's not, it's specifically built for their capsule. And, you know, it has a whole bunch of shell tiles to kind of, on this version to test temperature, to test pressure and stress. Now, so they're kind of confirming, you know, changing, altering all the computer models and everything so they can, they're hoping for a unmanned flight in late 2017 and more human crewed missions after that. So is this one of those things where they're going to build one, then burn it up? and get all the data and then fix it up or, or build an entirely new one, burn that one up? Is, is that what's going to happen? No, this is, this is hopefully not uh, test the destruction. Okay. This is build it, watch it come in, watch it come in happily, not burn up. <laughs> if it burns up, then you're sad. Right. There's large sad face. Fireworks. Yeah. Um, unhappy fireworks. Yes. But you now the theory is, you know, just test it. See what everything happens. If there's, you know, some temperature variation or stress variation that they don't like, then, you know, tweak the the analysis, tweak the building, um, 
of it so that they can get it right and then do their um, final sort of test flights in 2017 and then move on to human crewed missions. Very good. Wow. Well, it's kind of it's kind of exciting to, to see this process. I can't wait till uh, they're doing the man tests. So, yes. uh, any other thoughts? So it'll on that one? it'll be a little while. Okay, so going to be a few side bites is what you're saying. Yeah, 2018 is a couple of side bites away. All right. Any other thoughts? Uh, no, just kind of interested to see how NASA's doing. Well, hello there. That was quite the uh, that was what I expected from the soundboard at all. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes the Sci-Fi 2000 needs a good restart, Heather. That's all I can say about that. I want to just take a quick break right here, and uh, I wanted to update Hammy, who's in the chat room right now and didn't know about the new Daily Tech Talk Show. It's happening Monday through Thursdays over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And then we have patreon.com slash today, which is not just a fundraiser for Tech Talk Today, but it's also a way that you can contribute to the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. We have different pledging levels over there, and some pledges support just the show, and some pledges support the show and the whole Jupiter Broadcasting Network. It's a brand new platform for crowdfunding, and it's uh, something we're trying to strive, a balance between crowdfunding and sponsorship funding and we think we can get this mix with patreon so if you'd like to help us patreon.com slash today and check out tech talk today episode two came out uh well today it was see how that works uh yesterday was episode one just kicked it this month so there or this week so there you go uh tech talk today and uh, patreon.com slash today all right heather well that's all i have so why don't we move on to the news bite Okay, Heather, what are we talking about in the news bite? There are new discoveries of ticks fossilized in amber that show bacteria which causes Lyme disease that may have been around for 15 million years. Gross. Yeah, <laughs> this is not the most pleasant thing to talk no, about, but it is, is really looking. interesting. Okay, all right. In the, okay. In the U.S., uh, Europe, Asia... Their ticks are pretty much the biggest insect vector of disease, even larger than mosquitoes. And Lyme disease itself has only been recognized in the last 40 years. And before that, it was really misdiagnosed as various different things. You could have problems with your joints, your heart, uh, the nervous system. Yes, Lyme disease can be awful. Yes, and amber specifically, not a person, but amber the is caused by fossilized uh, tree sap, which is actually preserves things very well. They've been able to uh, find insects and sort of extract various things from them, be able to identify uh, their blood and, you know, if they have blood in them or various things like that. Dinosaur DNA, etc. Not Jurassic no? Park, oh, okay. as science sort of <laughs> shakes its head at you. <laughs> In a awe, isn't that cute kind of way? Um, now, these specific ones were, I mean, scientists have been studying 15 to 20 million year old amber. And this specific one is the oldest fossilized evidence of the bacteria that is like Lyme disease. Now, we've been sort of, to in a separate report, they also said that they found uh, ticks that have. Uh, the ancient for um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever and other sort of related illnesses. Now, in the last 30 years, they've been studying various diseases that are kind of revealed in the fossil record and a lot of times in these sort of amber, um, you know, things. So they've been able to document things like malaria and all sorts of different, you know, tick-borne diseases that are, they're showing up that could be actually considering much more common in history than we kind of ever thought. Uh-huh. And there's evidence that actually dinosaurs could have even been infected with pathogens like Lyme disease. You so, know, I mean, these are... Th it goes to show you that it's sometimes, you know, something that we think has become more prevalent just means we're better at tracking it, right? Is that kind of what you're yeah. getting at? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like we have only been diagnosing it in the last 40 years because we finally found, oh, this is something specific that's causing these things. Well, we got a lot better at tracking this kind of stuff, too. Yeah, then we start going, oh, well, you know, when did it start? Um, I go back a little ways this way, keep pushing the history barrier back, and now, you know, we're at 
15 million years ago, it was something very much like it was around. Wow. Huh. Well, I, I do think, too, I mean, I've made this point before, but I, I think a lot of the stuff is a, a likely to become a lot more common as just the ability to track the data and then share that data becomes more pervasive in our society. And it's, yes. we're just at the beginning of that process, but this is an interesting example of how once science was able to share, uh, you know, science became a shared uh, thing and not something people held in their own little silos, you start to see these things become a lot more common. Interesting stuff, Heather. Are you ready for the two-byte news? I'm ready. Let's go. Come on in, guys. It's the two-byte news. All right, Heather, what are we talking about in the two-byte news? So some students have recently launched sunglasses, air quotes. It's a project to help develop a better system of uh, sign language narration um, through different kinds of glasses, like Google Glass type things. Okay. Now, this project, by actual complete coincidence, the only two def- uh, students to ever get into this professor's computer science class signed up just as the National Science Foundation sort of funded this research. But so it actually gave them a big uh, sort of heads hit, head up going, hey, we've got a couple of students very fluent in sign language. This is going to be a big help for this. And so they went and they tested these um, these glasses. It was for planetarium use mainly. So it was, you know, you have a script, you know, that the planetarium, uh, you know, narrator would read. And in this case, if you're deaf, it's, you're either looking down at a person that's signing or you're looking up at the planetarium sky. You can't really do both. So this is sort of a sort of an answer to that. So they went and they tested it with a uh, school. And oddly enough, this is one of those things where they had the glasses and I think Google Glass is one of those things where it's displayed up in the sort of up in the corner. But these students liked the the image of the the video of the sign right in the middle of their vision. Mm Mm-hmm, I bet. So they could look at it and kind of look past it at the same time so they didn't have to change very much in order to see the narration. And so they kind of believe that, you know, they're going to publish their results here soon, and they're hoping that through further studies they could actually use it in other things. So maybe when you're reading a book and you don't understand a specific word, you point at it, uh-huh. you know, it'll take a picture of that yeah. word, and you can go back and figure it out later, or you know anything like that. You know which one but, I would like, and this one it involves a lot of creepy technology, so I, I almost hope it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would like that when I walk up to somebody, there could be some sort of facial recognition, and it could say, oh, this is so-and-so, you met them at so-and-so, their wife's name is such, and their kid's name is such and i and i could be like oh hey bob it's great to see you how's mary doing you know and i because i am so okay, bad creepy with factor uh just for your knowledge i have a coworker. we were accident like i was discussing this uh, project with him the other day he's like he'd gone to mit and he's like you know we had to be careful about the uh the guys in oh gosh now i don't remember uh, the program they were in mm-hmm. but they had cameras hooked up to themselves you know and up to, you know, computers, and mm. it was taking your face and doing facial recognition to the student body. And so it would, he's like, they would kind of just stand, stand and stare at you until your face, you know, was facial recognition to tell, so they could tell you. Awkward. So it would tell them who you were. Yeah. And so then I was like, so you stand there with like one hand, like half over your face, so they can't like tell who you are. Yeah, that's awkward. <laughs> So, yeah, so creepy factor, just so you know, that's kind of halfway here. Mm-hmm. Now, oh, in that case, it was yeah. not. I mean, it would require a lot of, you know, technology. Yeah, in that case, you're you're searching a specific body of people. You yeah. have X many students to scan through. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting, Heather. Well, I could see how, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be Google Glass, but I could see how products just like it could provide a ton of of extra use for folks who have a disability or folks who just need a little bit more information while they're doing something else. Hey, I, I'd like it. I could have the IRC up in my in my in one of my eyes while we're doing the show. Actually, on second thought, why don't instead, why don't we do an update? All right, Heather, what do we got? Last week, we talked about the ISEE-3. It is NASA's old satellite that uh, private people uh, 
you know, private engineers got together and they're sp- they were going to go talk to it and be able to use it. Yeah. They finally got the final check mark from NASA to go ahead and try to contact it. They did. They achieved two-way communication at 512 bits per second Woo! at a dazzling. Now, so they've been able to verify that uh, they had data through a number of different ground stations. And they're hope that eventually they'll be able to kind of change its trajectory so that they'll be able to capture it and be able to talk to it um, more frequently. Because the way its orbit na- is now, it was, you know, decades between being able to talk to it specifically. Okay. It's also orbiting around the sun. Yeah. And so dis- at this point, we're like, all right, well, take a- an orbit sort of around, you know, Earth-, Earth and the moon sort of in our area. Yeah, yeah. So that we can talk to you more frequently and perhaps send it to a comet or something else so we sort of renew the science of it. Now, I think, though, my favorite part of the story is their mission control. Yes, I saw that picture, and I had to share that picture. This is an old McDonald's, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, I thought so. <laughs> they had an option, I think, between an old uh, barbershop and an uh, old McDonald's. These are buildings near the center that have sort of been annexed and sort of included. And so they were kind of going around and deciding where they were allowed to be. And that's one of their choices. Too funny. Too funny. Well, you know what? Uh, I, it seems almost appropriate in a way that an old fast food re- restaurant would be used for something like this. Put yep, it to some but, good science use. Yeah. So they're communicating communicating with it. Now, the big dish that they had down at Arecibo, that was where they were doing a lot of their major communication, trying to switch it into various uh, modes so that hopefully they could talk to it better with some of the smaller um, dishes. They weren't able to quite do everything that they wanted to do mm. in the time frame they have had at that um, radio dish. Also, during their time, a small earthquake happened that oh. kind of took up some of their time. But it was okay. But So they've got, got it going and talking, and they're hoping that they can um, communicate it and control it. They, if they can maneuver it by June the 17th, they will still have enough of... Um, a delta V, which means they can change its orbit enough so they can get a little bit of a nicer orbit. And as it inches towards the moon, they're saying they're not actually ruling out that it might actually hit the moon. Oh. Very unlikely, but they're still not you know, to crossing that out of the round of mm. possibilities. Jeez. Okay. Good to know. Now, it's funny because with the – in order to – talk to it they had to get a very precise location on it so they're able to track it over a little bit of time get a more accurate um orbital mechanics and exactly where it is now in 2001 i believe it was nasa went through and had their you know saw what they had and kind of did their orbital um prediction about where it would be and so now they have their new data where it could be which wasn't quite matching up but they went back to the people in 1986. Oh, nice. Who went forward and predicted, and it's actually very close to the proper prediction. So they're like, hats off to the people back in the 80s who actually were really close to what was going to happen. The original math was now. right. Wow. Yeah, the original math was really good. That's by cool. coincidence or by really good math. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, heck. That's probably what they were doing, right? They were top of their yep. game. Look at them. Oh, yeah. Hmm. That's pretty neat. All right, Heather, any other thoughts on that one? Nope. Looking forward to uh, where they get to contact that with. All right. I don't want to freak you out. I don't want I don't want to make you scared or paranoid, but I don't know if you know about this, but Romulan oh. warbirds actually use an artificial quantum singularity to power their warp core. I have mm-hmm. stolen a Romulan artificial singularity. I have a suspended in a magnetic uh-huh. field, and this button will either collapse that magnetic field, thus sucking the entire Earth into this artificial singularity, or it's a spacecraft update. Good news, everybody. It's a spacecraft update. What do we got, Heather? We're still here. <laughs> why why is right. it do our update, then? <laughs> yeah, I know. So the previous version of NASA, of, uh, sorry, Space SpaceX's Dragon capsule, you know, it's delivering uh, goods to the space station right now. So, you know, it's worthy enough to get there. But 
the life support system in it not reliable enough for human passengers. Oh, okay. Now they've actually unveiled their new capsule that will be able to carry seven astronauts for seven days. And it has environmental controls, life support, make a very kind of comfortable environment for them. And when it would reach the space station, the current, you know, their current uh, craft, the arm, the space station arm has to reach out, grab it, and, you know, hand do dock it to the space station. This specific one would be able to, on its own, uh, dock with the space station without any extra assistance. Hmm. So, and then when it coming back to Earth, it could do the, you know, backup typical three parachutes land in the land in the ocean, or it could use its main landing technique, which is engines that would let it land like a helicopter. That's what they say. With the you, accuracy of a helicopter. Do you believe it? Do you think it's possible? They've been testing uh, like the big rockets, like the type of um, tall rockets that, you know, the same look that like sent Apollo up. Yeah. You know, they've been testing those and like shooting them up higher and higher and then landing them right back down on the ground. Okay. All right. Well, so I believe it. it is perfectly within their capabilities of doing this. And of course, they, they always have the backup plan of uh, into the ocean. That, but, in, that interior looks pretty sweet, pretty swanky oh, yeah. with those big LCD screens and stuff. But yeah, and according to them, currently NASA pays uh, Russia about $71 million per astronaut uh, to get to the space station. Oh. And SpaceX thinks they could get it to $20 million or less. So mm -hmm. much cheaper, and they think that this, uh, the protection this craft could actually possibly get to a lunar mission in the, you know, Obviously, do the Earth orbit for the space station, and maybe even get to the moon. I'm ready. So Bring it. So they've got some. They've got some dreams, and they're getting very clo uh, getting closer and closer to being testing this. So NASA's got its thing. SpaceX has got its thing. We're moving on uh, multiple fronts towards having more ways to get the space station in into space, which <laughs> is always good. Mm -hmm. Come on, Star Trek. Come on, Star Trek. Well, while we're talking about space, why don't we go over and do a curiosity update? Are you ready? Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. Okay. So how is our favorite rover doing? Our favorite rover is sort of in its uh, cruising across the countryside time. Yep. It's had its moment of drilling rocks and it's got its sample sort of in hand, sort of ready to test as it rolls around and does uh, its cross-country venture. So it's headed on to Mount Sharp now, which is the mountain that it's kind of aiming towards. It has lots of different layers in the center of this crater. So they're hoping they'll be able to get more views on uh, what the water possibly was doing in this area. Okay. So they're kind of heading towards that. They've got their powdered samples ready to um, go through their various tests. So... They're kind of in a pausing stage right now, which is kind of where they're going to be for a little while. Yeah, that's hey. When you got a country road trip, it's a summer road trip, Heather. How about it? It is. They've <laughs> they've got a long road trip ahead of them. All right, we'll jump in the time machine because it's time for us to go back in time. Here we go, Heather. Okay. Close the door. Oh, oh yeah. I can, you know, we've done this so many times, Heather. I'm starting to tell. I can. I'm going to say this is this is maybe like half a century we've just traveled. I, I don't know for sure. Wait, let me check the notes. In fact, 56 years ago, the time machine just took us June 7th, 1958. Heather, what the heck happened this week in science? That was good analysis. The semi-annual article that launched the widespread use of ultrasound in medical diagnostics was published. So after a few years of developing the kind of experimental use of ultrasound, he was able to use it to treat patients in a hospital. In this specific article that he posted, he described it how he was able to diagnose a and easily remove a cyst from a woman who'd been diagnosed by other doctors as an inoperable stomach cancer. Mm. So they'd all said, it's unoperable stomach cancer. Sorry, there's nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. He used ultrasound and said, well, actually, it's very operable and I can do this and you'll be okay. Now, this guy, he knew a lot about sonar from his uh, service in World War II and industrial use from, you know, ultrasound reflected waves in 
detect flaws in materials and other sort of things. Okay. So using all his knowledge, he was able with to work with some other people and launch this new technology in medicine that has really helped a lot of different people. Wow, no kidding. So ultrasounds are only 56 years old then. Yes. Uh, which is kind of amazing now because like you think about like how how prevalent, prevalent they, are they are in medical practice. I mean just, you know, like mothers, right? Newborn oh, and, like, yeah. that's been my one of my most primary experiences with them is with our three kids. You know, that was a that was a big part of of uh, of that process. So it's amazing yeah. to think what it would have been like. And now I think about it, I you know, I do recall my grandfolks talking about how they didn't have ultrasounds back then. I, in fact, I've had other family members mention it too. Now they think about it, so it's yeah, it's some of the it's one that's of these technologies was, I take for granted, though. Yeah, and that's when it was like just coming out. So then you have that time lag where it right before it gets adopted everywhere. Yeah, before it spreads essentially everywhere, so that various medical practices and various you know in all the places can actually get it. Yeah, interesting. All right, well, let me recalibrate the Cybi two thousand so we can. Look up into the sky this week. This week on Thursday, June the 5th, we have the first quarter moon. And after dark, you could be able to see the kind of easy to spot constellation Cassiopeia. It looks like a giant kind of squash W off to the north horizon. You can look really cool po- pointing out a constellation. <laughs> now, the planet lineup this week, we've got Mercury. Hey-o. Around about twilight time, look low in the west and northwest going to be fading and sinking low to the horizon pretty quickly and it's sort of on its way out we're not going to be able to see it much longer we've got venus our morning star low in the east during dawn mars is out at late twilight yeah. going to be appearing high in the south Hey-o. and the setting in the west about 2 or 3 a.m daylight savings jupiter Boom. at twilight it's shining high in the west and the twi- and setting soon after dark, so you're not going to be able to okay. have a sort of a short window of opportunity for okay. Jupiter. Got to get got to jump on that one. Yep, has an early bedtime this week. Uh, Saturn in the evenings is also hanging out in the southeast, moving to its highest point in the skies in the south about 11 or 12 p.m. Well, there you go. So we've got Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn up in the sky. And, of course, everything else Heather covered is in the show notes with links, pictures, videos, and all of that good stuff. In fact, if you heard something at some point in this show, I got a pro tip for you. Are you ready for this? Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Click on SciBite 133. And then guess what? Everything Heather talked about is listed in chronological order. And you can go look it up and read more about it on your own, including that looking up into the sky. Heather, is there anything else we want to cover this week? Not that I can think of. Well, very good then. Before we wrap up, I'll say don't forget, we'd love to have you join us live. Head over to jblive.tv on a Tuesday, or even better, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, and then you'll just get it converted to your local time. It's really super crazy easy. And then last but not least, you can tweet at Heather. She's jb underscore mars underscore base on the Twitters, or go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click the contact link and choose Sidebite from the dropdown. All right, Heather, well, thank you for the great show. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week. 